This is Christopher Cernike, hosting episode 3 of season 3 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today, on the Current Topics in Science podcast, we have the honor of hosting Dr. John Bumgardner. Dr. Bumgardner has a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Texas Tech University, and he's received his Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Princeton University. And he has both a Master of Science and a PhD in Geophysics and Space Physics from the University of California, Los Angeles. He's worked on gas dynamic laser research at the Air Force Weapons Laboratory and is the creator of Terra, which is a 3D spherical shelled finite element model for the Earth's mantle. He is a former staff scientist at the theoretical division at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he researched planetary mantle dynamics and a global ocean model for investigating climate change. He was a member of the Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth, and he's developed a high-tech computer program called Mendel's Accountant, which models mutation and natural selection. He is the Senior Research Associate at Logos Research Associates, and he is the Research Professor at Liberty University. Now, without further ado, good morning, Dr. Bumgardner. How was your day, and how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bumgardner. It's a pleasure and joy to have you on. Now, since this is Current Topics in Science, we're going to quickly look at this week's current topic. So this week's current topic is actually a rather explosive topic, as we're going to be covering an article from the official Lima, Ohio news site called Volcano Leaves Scientists in Awe. The article is reporting on Mount Etna, the most active volcano in Europe, and says... For over a week, Etna has been belching lava, ash, and volcanic rocks on a regular basis. The nearby Katina Airport closed temporarily, and residents of the town of Padara said it appeared one day last week as if it were raining rocks as a thick blanket of ash covered the town. Dr. Bumgardner, what do you think of this event? Does it remind you of anything from your own personal research? Well, certainly these, these large eruptions are spectacular displays of the power that uh, nature can uh, display. And uh, I think more, we see more frequent eruptions of this type in Hawaii, but this is certainly a, a spectacular eruption that's taking place right now there in, uh, in Sicily and in Italy. Uh, but compared with what happened during the flood, compared with what the, the, the radical transformation of the face of the earth during the flood, this is, that kind of eruption is, is nothing. Uh, the, uh, the evidence from today's seafloor uh, shows that the, during the flood itself, 70% of the ocean, at least, I'm sorry, 70% of the earth was covered in a, a thick layer of basaltic uh, magma, uh, something on aver averaging on the order of 20,000 feet thick. So if you imagine 70% of the earth covered with uh, rock that had just recently been molten to a depth of 20,000 feet, it just, it staggers the mind. Human being can't even relate to such cataclysm. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the kind of thing I've been working on for the last 40 years, trying to understand that cataclysm. That's pretty incredible, Dr. Bumgardner, and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that volcano. And while we're on actually the subject of volcanoes, you've actually published several papers on volcanic activity yourself. 
such as this paper called Io's Volcanic and Sublimation Atmospheres. Dr. Bumgardner, on one of your biographical pages, I saw that it said you have over 80 peer-reviewed publications. I'm wondering, can you tell us what was some of the most fascinating scientific research you've ever done? Well, that's uh, a, a challenging question. I've done lots of exciting uh, research. Uh, the thing that comes to mind were the very exciting discoveries we made during the course of the, the RATE project. RATE stands for radioisotopes in the age of the Earth. And uh, uh, one extremely exciting discovery was uh, we, we measured or we actually contracted out the measurement of how fast helium that's produced from radioactive decay diffuses or migrates through tiny zircon crystals. Uh, we had found, we, we documented that there are high levels of helium still in these zircon crystals. And uh, it was our strong hunch that that, zircon, that helium could not remain there very long, certainly not uh, millions or hundreds of millions or billions of years like the secular establishment was claiming. So we actually measured that rate of diffusion and the rate we got uh, was uh, almost perfectly aligned with the prediction we made ahead of time that if the earth was only like 6,000 years old, uh, we, we, we estimated what the rate should be. And when we got the results back, that curve, the two curves were indistinguishable. And uh, so that was one of the most exciting uh, 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 discoveries, pieces of work, uh, pieces of evidence uh, that, I, that I had the privilege of being part of. Another one in the same research project uh, was that I, I sent off samples. I was, I was head up, heading up the C-14 sub-project of that work, and we uh, verified that there is C-14 in diamonds, and that was a very unexpected uh, and, and is hard, essentially impossible for secular scientists to explain uh, in terms of, a, of an ancient earth. It means that that uh, C-14 was produced very recently uh, in these diamonds, which are, uh, you know, so hard, it's, it, you, you, there's no process that can cause that C-14 to get in there from the outside. It has to be produced internal to the diamond and has, has to have uh, occurred in the recent past. So that, those, are, those are some examples of exciting things, just a few of uh, things I've experienced during my scientific career. Actually, you know, I, as, a, as a creationist, I was somewhat unusual working at Los Alamos National Laboratory. That's where I spent most of my scientific career. And, uh, you know, there were uh, some of the top scientists in their fields in the world at that laboratory. Just down the hall, I could go to uh, talk to the world expert in, in, in a particular field of pe people. Uh, in my very division, most of the Nobel laureates that had been at Los Alamos were in the theoretical division where I was. And uh, so I was keenly aware of how, how earnestly people in that uh, community are uh, looking to make a, an important discovery, a significant discovery that would be recognized by their peers. Uh, and uh, since, you know, many of them do make those kinds of discoveries. But yet, as I looked at the kind of discoveries that God allowed me to make, uh, uh, I, uh, multiple discoveries that, uh, you know, I, the, the discoveries like these people just only dreamed of that might happen once in their lifetime to them. Yet, in, as a servant of, of uh of the living God uh, seeking to do his will, he allowed me the, the experience to make many of these kinds of discoveries during my scientific career. So it's, uh, uh, for me, uh, 
was very, uh, very exciting to be a Christian and working in, in you know, on scientific issue, issues, and many of them relating to uh, biblical issues, biblical apologetics, uh, and, uh, you know, in, in, in that field, in, in that kind of environment, uh, the, it, the competition is very intense. Lots of, you have lots of competition. But if you're trying to research issues relating to the, the flood, to creation, to uh, things re- relating to what the Bible says the real history of the earth is like, there's not a lot of competition. There's only a handful of scientists that are working on those things. So the opportunities to make significant discoveries are all over the place. And uh, so uh, I'm, I, 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 I praise God for that, that experience, that opportunity. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that this interview might encourage some, uh, some believers, some y- young people who are gifted by God and have a sense of a calling of the calling of God on their lives to think of stepping out and, and uh, doing something similar to what I've done. So uh, yes, uh, the uh, making discoveries in this realm is, uh, is exciting. And, uh, uh, and I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to have had those experiences. Dr. Bumgardner, thank you so much for sharing all of that. That actually inspired me, and I know that many of the people listening, they're going to connect to some of those very personal experiences you shared. I think it was interesting how you brought up that there's actually a whole field of opportunities just waiting in the wings for young Christians who are scientists who want to get into biblical research. It's all right there for them. And speaking of research... Dr. Bumgardner, in an article called Leading Researcher, Dr. John Bumgardner joined School of Engineering faculty. It states that Terra was developed 10 years before experts in the field were predicting that it would be possible. Dr. Bumgardner, can you tell us about Terra, how it was created, what it was used for, and about your inspiration in designing the program? Let me back up just a little bit before that. Uh, I, uh, it was in the spring of 1978. Uh, I was at, at that time, I was on the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, working on, uh, had been on, on the University of Kentucky campus for two years. Uh, I, I already had, had a lot of scientific training, um, and, uh, because of that, uh, they assigned me some, uh, un- some little bit special duties there. Uh, my first assignment was to head up a classroom lecture uh, thrust on campus. There's a, out, a group called uh, Probe Ministries from Texas. They were there doing classroom l- lectures for a week. And leading up to that, I was training students how to approach their professors, how to schedule these special talks on issues uh, uh, related to the course courses, but from a biblical perspective. I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, as people found out about this, I, I got more and more invitations. There was one month I did 30 lectures in one month's time. And uh, anyway, Campus Crusade found out about it and invited me to spend a year at their headquarters trying to make the materials that I was using transferable to other staff. It was during that year I had time to work on some of the issues that I had not had time to look into that deeply uh, before. And one of those issues had to do with how this new theory of plate tectonics relates to the Genesis flood. And uh, as I looked into it, it was like an epiphany. I, I, I realized well, the Spirit of God just revealed, showed me, gave me, showed me the evidence that makes it so clear that uh, the flood had to be, logically had to be, a large-scale tectonic catastrophe as well as a, a water catastrophe. I, I found myself reeling, trying to say, you know, what am I supposed to do with this 
understanding because I had no training in earth science at that point. My Up to that point, all my training had been in electrical engineering. I not, didn't even have one course in earth science. Uh, so I took a, a, a huge step of, of leaving Campus Crusade, beginning a graduate program there at UCLA in earth science, you know, not having a single course in my background. The first year I took about half graduate classes and half undergraduate classes undergraduate classes to fill in some of the huge gaps in my background. Uh, but anyway, God, I had, didn't have to be at UCLA very long until I realized God indeed had called me. I saw incredible doors opened. And one of the doors was uh, the opportunity to do my PhD research at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And uh, actually, I had... I won't go into the detail, but a miraculous set of circumstances that opened that door uh, where I was invited to write a little proposal, what I wanted to do in my PhD research. And uh, it was approved. I I just wrote my own ticket, everything I could think I would need to do my work at Los Alamos. And it was approved. So uh, anyway, and and one of the things that was um, one of the things that uh, was part of that was uh, there was a mathematician at Los Alamos who had just discovered a numerical technique that was destined to change the scientific world, the engineering world. Um, and uh, and so when I, I visited there, this would have been, I think, the spring of 80, 81. Yeah, spring of 81 winter of 81, he shared with me the, you know, what this numerical method could do and that it was well suited to the problem that I was wanting to do, and that is develop a 3D model for flow inside the earth. And uh, as he described what it, you know, what its advantages are, benefits were, I found that I, it was too good to be true. I, I just could couldn't allow myself to believe it was real, uh, but I needed a an advisor if I was going to work there, and he seemed to be the logical advisor. So when I came there a few months later, we started working together. Uh, we worked very well together. When I'd been in the Air Force, uh, worked at the Air Force Weapons Lab doing that laser research, uh, I had I developed, I had, I gained some experience in, in writing large scale three dimensional computer programs. And so uh, I had the, I guess I had the confidence that I could do this. So, and I also developed the, uh, uh, ability, the patience to, you know, debug code. Whereas this mathematician is very good theoretically, but he just didn't have the attention span, the focus to debug code. So we worked well together. So in, so in just a few months' time, we put together this spherical program using a very special spherical mesh that had uh, almost a, a perfectly uniform set of triangles covering the surface of the sphere. Uh, together with his numerical method, which... Uh, uh, together with the Cray computers, which were there at Los Alamos, gave me an incredible advantage in in doing these large-scale computations, three-dimensional calculations. At that time, the literature uh, was saying that that type of 3D calculation was at least a decade away because computers would not be fast enough for another 10 years. Well, they didn't, weren't accounting for the, the, the possibility there might be a numerical technique that could uh, make a big difference. Anyway, uh, so that that um, uh, enabled me working with this mathematician to put together what the code that is now known as Terra. And uh, uh, and so when I came back, it was when I was, came back to UCLA it was time for me to take what was called the field exam. That's normally when you present your research proposal for what you're planning to do for your PhD research. Well, in that in that field exam session with my committee, I presented the results 
uh, from this 3D code. It was working. I was getting beautiful results. I had developed good graphics, so I showed these beautiful pictures, and uh, the committee was just blown away. They were dumbfounded. They couldn't believe anybody had, had, had accomplished that. And so, whereas when, when I went to UCLA, I was wondering how in the world can I uh, uh, come up with a thesis topic that these secular people will accept that's also, you know, uh, right in the in the in the, in the path that I need to, to model the flood. Well, God basically just handed it to me on a silver platter, uh, and uh, you know that the this mathematician played a huge role enabling me to do it. So God just made it happen, and and the, you know UCLA was excited that someone from their institution was the first to develop something like this. So they were very excited about it. There was no issue with me um, getting a PhD. And, uh, you know, my immediate thought, I thought of that verse in Proverbs where it talks about, about God turning the hearts of kings like streams of water. Something like, like that had to be going on with these men for them to decide to give me that kind of uh, position, that kind of uh, opportunity. So. Uh, I started working there. They made good. That that was a, a solid offer. I was able to spend a lot of my time working on uh, modeling the flood. Uh, and I, about a year, and that was, I started in ni early 1984. In uh, 1986, I published my first paper uh, on this catastrophic plate tectonics idea. And uh, so I had had uh, uh, opportunity to really make lots of progress on that on that concept and that idea, and uh, so that's that's that that was that was the background for Terra, how Terra came to be, and uh, so so while I was at Los Alamos, I was able to upgrade Terra a lot, and you know I advised let's see three PhDs while I was there all of them that used Terra for their PhD work. One of those guys is now uh, a full, has been a full professor at the University of Munich, uh, head of the department there uh, for, I don't know, over 10 years doing, uh, doing cutting edge research. Uh, and uh, so it's, it, it's uh, and, and Terra still used, still used by that group in Europe used by several other groups in Europe and Australia and elsewhere. So uh, Terra is still in use and, and still uh, of interest to the secular world. So uh, anyway, that's, a, that's the background, some background on Terra. Thank you so much, Dr. Bumgardner. It's really amazing how you were sharing, like, God, he just kept giving you all of these amazing opportunities. They just kept coming and coming and coming, and now... Terra is being used worldwide, and that reminds me, besides Terra, you also have a spherical grid method that's used by the German Weather Service, Next Generation Global Weather Forecast Models. In fact, 20 other countries have adopted your model for their own weather forecasts. Dr. Bumgardner, Jesus spoke of people being able to discern the face of the sky, but I would appreciate it if you could help us discern the face of the antediluvian sky. Dr. Bumgardner, from your own personal research or thoughts on the matter, what were the weather conditions like prior to the global Genesis flood? To, to address that question, the main uh, source of information is the rock record. And, uh, and, and certainly the, the, fossil, the fossils that the rock record contains. So what kind of fossils do we find? What, what, are the, what kinds of uh, fossils do we find in the rock record from, the, the, uh, from animals and plants that were alive at the beginning of that cataclysm? Well, one prominent uh, uh, feature of that record are the vast coal deposits that we have around the earth. Uh, just a, a staggering amount of plant material. And uh, 
for, for that plant material, that much plant material to exist and be buried uh, during the flood requires that the earth prior to the flood had to be extremely uh, lush and a, a large fraction of it covered by um, heavy vegetation. So that to me implies that climate conditions were much different from today. Probably the, the, uh, the earth was warmer from, from equator to pole, more moist, more conducive to uh, plant growth. And uh, so what was different? Well, I'm, uh, it's my guess, and, and I did do some climate research, so I mean, this is not just a, a wild guess. My guess is that the, the CO2 levels were higher. You know, there's a lot of concern today about, it, it, you know, burning of fossil fuels and increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. But as you look at the rock record, there it appears that before the flood, the CO2 level was at least five times what it is today, and the Earth was very, uh, very well suited for uh, lots of life. So it didn't result in a catastrophe. So I believe there was some uh, uh, that much CO2 in the atmosphere would 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 give a would warm the Earth. And, and uh, even at, at relatively high latitudes near the poles. And, uh, and I, I believe the, the, in general, the climate was more moist everywhere. And, you know, there's some debate in creation circles whether there was rain before the flood. In my, uh, it's my uh, conclusion that yes, very, almost certainly there was rain. The earth was watered by rain. It's such an efficient way to water the earth. And so uh, I, I believe there was rain, not, not uh, violent, not the kind of violent thunderstorms for the most part that we see today, but more, uh, you know, gentle rain over most of the earth. So uh, yes, there was a different climate regime. Uh, there may well have been some increase in the atmospheric pressure, more, more mass in the atmosphere, uh, more, more CO2, a, a modest greenhouse effect, and uh, generally favorable conditions for life all over the Earth. Dr. Bumgardner, thank you so much for discussing the weather conditions prior to the Genesis flood. And speaking of the deluge, I recall that you stated, God has called me to work on the flood. It has been my focus now for more than 40 years. Dr. Bumgardner, in that 40 years of research, have you had any like epiphany moments or moments where it seemed like the data was pointing in a direction that you didn't expect? And can you tell us what that was like? I've already shared some epiphany uh, experiences. Let me share one more. And this was from the fairly recent past. Uh, over the last 10 years, I've been, uh, in addition to using Terra to understand the tectonics of the flood, I've, I realize, I've decided it's time to try to get serious about explaining how all these sediments were deposited on the continents during the flood. Today, there's on average uh, about 6,000 feet of layered fossil bearing sediments over, over, over the continents. You know, they're, they're thickest on the continental shelves, but the average is still uh, on the order of 6,000 feet. So how did, how did so much sediment get eroded, transported and deposited during just a few months time? Well, a fairly big discovery was about Six or seven years ago, I, I discovered that tsunamis that are a logical consequence of rapid plate tectonics uh, are able to do this. Uh, and uh, and the, the tsunamis are generated when these plates that are plunging into the earth uh, stick against the overriding plate and then release and slip. 
So there's, whenever there's a, a, a slip, there's a potential for a tsunami. And with this, uh, with the plates going about a billion times faster than they are today, those, those kind of stick slip events uh, generate much bigger tsunamis than we see in the world uh, in our lifetime. So uh, uh, I developed a, a computer model to model this uh, process uh, and uh, use some of the some of the software I developed in working on climate change issues at Los Alamos. I use some of the same code to uh, uh, model uh, uh, the ocean over the Earth, uh, and, uh, and and driven motions in that ocean driven by these impulsive tsunamis. And uh, basically, I had uh, a, a a tsunami happening somewhere on the earth every minute or two. I think it was in the model I, I published is every two minutes, a, a, a gigantic tsunami being unleashed somewhere. So during the course of the flood, and I was keeping it to like 150 days, you have something like between 50 and 100,000 mega tsunamis. And uh, so, uh, and I showed in my, I've, I've showed in these calculations, there is uh, that, the, the, that kind of forcing is sufficient to erode, transport, and deposit that much sediment in just uh, five months' time. So, my first, I, I published the first, um, uh, first results of this back five years ago. And then, um, it, it was a rather crude model at that point. It just had one supercontinent on the Earth that that uh, was just stayed in the same place, and uh, you know that that's that's uh, pretty that's very crude for the flood. And I realized it would be much more realistic to have the continents break apart and move as the geology indicates they did do during the the uh, time of the flood. So my last paper that I published in 2018, presented at the uh, International Conference on Creationism in Pittsburgh, uh, had included that feature of, of moving continents as, as this erosion, uh, as the tsunamis were, were going off and the erosion was taking place, sediment was being transported in the turbulent water that resulted, and then where the velocities got low enough deposition taking place. So it was a pretty, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things going on, a lot of activity, a lot of dynamics unfolding in this, in this calculation. And uh, so I presented this work in, uh, in the summer of 2018. And then it wasn't, in, as far as the surprise, the, uh, uh, and, and something unexpected, I, you know, in, in getting, pulling all that together, giving the talk, I hadn't looked at the data carefully enough to, to realize, to appreciate that the, my result or a, 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 a very uh, astonishing uh, similarity to the actual pattern of sediment on the earth today on the continents. So even though the model is still very crude, uh, it has a, apparently has enough realism to get the, um, get the pattern approximately, you know, pro approximately correct. Some of the main areas where there's large thicknesses of sediment are the same regions that this model uh, shows thick layers of sediment. So uh, that was a, a a sort of an epiphany. You know, it showed that even though I was immersed in all of this, uh, all of these calculations, uh, you know, the most important con uh, result was staring me in the face and I was oblivious to it. I, wa I wasn't really expecting it to be, to work out that well. Uh, so, th so that's that's the example I would share in response to your question. Thank you so much. That is incredible. That was a very interesting story. 
And you mentioned catastrophic plate tectonics. Uh, some of your research it brought to mind that that was the development that you made as a mechanism for the Genesis flood. In an interview with Dr. Wieland and Dr. Batten, you said, I believe there's now overwhelming evidence in favor of continental breakup and large-scale plate tectonic activity. Dr. Bumgardner, can you tell us, do you still hold to this view? And if so, what evidence or current data supports these ideas? Of course, I hold that view still. Uh, there's the, uh, the evidence that the plates have moved, that the continents have, have migrated, uh, is, in my view, it's, it's, it is overwhelming. Uh, and, and it's mostly the fe features in the seafloor that, uh, that uh, do such a compelling job of making the case. Uh, plate tectonics explains, uh, explains the mid-ocean ridge system, uh, the segmentation of, of that system, uh, sh short straight segments that are, that are offset uh, and, and experiments done almost 50 years ago using paraffin shows that uh, when you pull paraffin apart on a on a on a on a surface where, where you've got a cold uh, the a brittle layer on the top underneath a a layer that deforms plastically you get that very kind of pattern so that's been demonstrated very clearly demonstrated for almost 50 years you get the the it, these these segments are offset by, by what are called transform faults, strike slip faults. And these are all over the ocean floor and prominent near the mid-ocean ridge system. And uh, they have a trace, they leave behind a trace that are called fracture zones that can extend for thousands of miles. And then you have, uh, in addition, features like chains of, of uh, volcanic ocean islands. Islands have migrated appear to have migrated, but it, it's a result of the plate moving over a hot spot where the volcanism is taking place. A, a very good example is Hawaii and the uh, what's known as the Hawaiian emperor chain of volcanoes. Uh, a good fraction of those are now underwater because the seafloor has cooled and uh, subsided. So uh, there are all of these features, the, 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 the trenches at subduction, subduction zones, the uh, you know, seismic tomography shows that these plates uh, penetrate, in some cases, all the way down to the coromantal boundary. So there's that kind of verification that uh, subduction in plate tectonics is valid. Then you have GPS measurements now. With GPS uh, becoming so accurate, one can measure the very slow motions of the plates and you show that these large patches of the Earth's surface move in a coherent manner, plate-like manner, and, uh, and at, at, at uh, these uh, mid-ocean ridges, you have the plates pulling apart like the theory implies. At, at trenches, you find the, the GPS shows that the plates are converging. And so I, I would say the, and then the distribution of earthquakes and volcanoes around the earth is strong, also strong confirmation. And there is, there is no other framework that, you know, con that can explain these, these, these very prominent features uh, in, the, in the structure of the earth. So to me, and this was this was uh, pretty evident. Uh, actually, when I started working, when I started my work at UCLA, most a lot of this GPS wasn't around, but most a lot of these observations were uh, well known back then. So there's, uh, I, I say, there's it's to me it's it's foolishness in the creation community to debate the reality of plate tectonics. That's just, uh, there's no, what, what competing idea you have to offer. You don't have one, uh, I would say to some of these people. So yes, I'm, 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 I've not changed my view at all uh, from many years ago. Dr. Bumgardner, 
In that same interview, the scientists at CMI, they asked you a question about the concept of runaway subduction. And they wanted to know why it hasn't really been seriously explored by many of your colleagues. And I found your response to be very interesting. You said that your old Earth colleagues didn't have the motivation to pursue this effect because the same kind of uniformitarian glasses prevent them from giving much attention to the evidence for catastrophism in the sedimentary record. Dr. Bumgardner, so this is a three-pronged question. May you please explain what is runaway subduction? Why is it relevant to the age of the Earth? And may you please explain why considering our philosophical framework is important? Okay, so those are pretty broad, separate issues, but let me, let me begin with what is, what is uh, runaway subduction. Okay, uh, I, I briefly mentioned that if one looks at the, the speeds of the plates today, uh, of, a, of a, like a few inches per year, and if you look at how much plate motion has to have occurred during the, the flood, based on what the Bible records as the true history of the earth, then, then uh, the, the logic forces you to realize that uh, the entire Atlantic Ocean had to open during the flood. The uh, North America had to migrate away from Europe and Africa uh, all during a few, few weeks' time during the flood. And uh, the whole, basically the whole Pacific Ocean has to, the ocean, all that ocean floor has to form during the flood. And uh, if you run the numbers, you find that you need a plate speed on the order of five miles per hour, about two meters per second, uh, to for that kind of motion to take place in that time frame. So, uh, so it's it's uh, it's it's uh, so in order so you've got to speed up the the plate plates by a factor of about a billion. Uh, and uh, so from about uh, from about five centimeters, 10 centimeters per year, up to two meters per year, that's, that's a factor of about, about a billion. And uh, so how does, so if, if you're gonna have the plate tectonics taking place, you've got to speed up the, uh, the rate of plates plunging into the earth by about that same factor. Um, about a billion. But today, the mantle, based on many kinds of measurements we can make, is extremely strong. The mantle, for example, when an earthquake takes place, seismic waves propagate through the mantle, through the earth. We measure the seismic speed, and uh, based on the, the, the speed that seismic waves propagate through the earth, one concludes that the strength of the mantle is comparable to the strength of steel, okay? And so you're trying to uh, have a, a, a plate sink through something as strong as steel in a few weeks' time. So how, how can that possibly happen? Well, that's a huge question, important, vital question. And uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, even back in, when I started, the answer was pretty obvious. That the, the answer is is that uh, silicate minerals, as most most solids, can undergo what is called solid state creep, where defects in the in a crystal migrate when that crystal is placed under stress. So that if you've got a extra atom in in in, in certain places and in, in uh, Missing atoms, other places you put stress on that crystal, those extra atoms will be have a tendency to migrate through the crystal to where the vacancies are, and the result is permanent deformation of the crystal. And that process, uh, one name for it is creep, solid state creep. And uh, it turns out that that type of uh, deformation. Uh, based on experiments for 
the last 40 or 50 years in laboratories is, is very sensitive. It's sensitive to temperature. It's also sensitive to this level of stress, shear stress. And, uh, it, it, uh, and, and exp exp laboratory experiments show that these minerals, silicate minerals that make up the rock in the mantle, uh, can weaken by a factor of a billion or more for changes in stress uh, in the range that can occur in a planet, the mass of the Earth, the size of the Earth. So, uh, so the uh, the key to this runaway process is the weakening that the minerals can experience when they're under stress. So, if you have a plate that's that's able, is, is somewhat. Uh, beginning to plunge into the earth where as it's trying to work, work its way down, there's stress around the, around the boundary of that plate. And in that region, the rock is weaker. And also there can be, there's typically some heating there as the deformation occurs that weakens the rock even more. And basically the, uh, the runaway takes place when, as the, as the rock weakens, it, it, uh, it plunges down faster. That faster velocity weakens it further, which allows the velocity to go up higher. And that, that uh, is a positive feedback effect. And it just uh, causes the plate to speed to increase almost without limit. And it results in a weakening. And the numerical calculations show that once that starts to happen, the zone of weakening dramatically enlarges such that the, the whole mantle becomes weak and the whole mantle can o then overturn quickly. So most, much of the work, much of the tedious and uh, painstaking work I've done over the last 40 years has been to improve the numerical methods and allow, come up with, with a good enough computer techniques to track this uh, this uh, this physical catastrophe. If I'm not careful, it will cause the code to crash. The numerical methods are not robust enough to handle such a, such strong changes in material properties over short distances. But one of the students I advised in the 90s, he did his PhD at the University of Illinois, he made a major breakthrough. To, to find a numerical method that could cope with that. And so since, uh, since around 2000, I've had the ability using his, his uh, contributions, his work to actually model this runaway uh, numerically. And uh, so I show that it, just using lat results from the laboratory, putting those into the code, using these methods that are, that are robust enough to, to cope with it, you get a runaway, you get a runaway conditions and rapid ra it allows these, these, these labs, these plates at the surface to plunge down through 2000 miles of solid rock in the mantle in a matter of a few weeks time. So the physics is there. The, uh, uh, the, the, uh, you know, so, 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 you know, the reason my colleagues, well, my colleagues just they they this this possibility is not on the radar screen. They're not, you know, they're not motivated to look into it. And so that's why I've been able to do it and they've they haven't. They they just haven't had any motivation really to look into it and to but I say if they include the 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 physics, you know, the proper physics, they'll get the same result as I get. And so uh the philosophical aspects of it, uh, I would say, have to do with whether you trust the Bible to be true history, to be providing the true history of the world or not. And uh, because Jesus put his stamp of authority on the writings of Moses very clearly, he says, if, if you don't believe Moses, how can you believe me? Uh, and so he, he, he 
definitely put his stamp of authority on what Moses wrote, including the first 11 chapters of uh, Genesis, including the chapters uh, seven, eight, seven and eight of Genesis, which describe the flood. And uh, so uh, since I'm convinced that Jesus indeed is authentic, uh, that means what he said about the writings of Moses is, is correct, means that what, what Moses wrote is genuine history. And so, uh, so that's the logical um, uh, framework in which I'm working, that believing that the Bible is giving the true history of the world. And, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting to verify through, you know, these examples I've given that indeed it is the, the accurate history of the world. Amen. And Dr. Bumgardner, while we're on the subject of the components of flood geology, we should look at some of the criticisms of catastrophic plate tectonics. Dr. William Worker, who has a Bachelor of Science with Honors in Physics and a PhD in Mathematics from the University of Bristol, he's currently working on finding a scientific resolution as to how the heat release during the Genesis flood was removed without raising environmental temperatures beyond biological endurance limits. In a paper called Heat Problems Associated with Genesis Flood Models, Dr. Warwicker wrote, the Genesis flood must have produced drastic geological changes involving extremely energetic processes, which must also have generated an enormous heat load. Yet, since the inhabitants of the Ark and many aquatic creatures survived the flood, this heat must have been removed without raising temperatures beyond their biological endurance limits. Dr. Bumgardner, what are scientifically plausible resolutions to the heat problems of the Genesis flood models, like catastrophic plate tectonics? Well, first let me say that Bill Walker is a friend, friend of mine, uh, and uh, you know he is talking about a, a problem uh, an issue, a very, very prominent issue in catastrophic plate tectonics. Actually, in my very first paper published in 1986 on catastrophic plate tectonics, I, I pointed out this very problem. And my conclusion is that there is nothing in the laws of physics that uh, will uh, can, can account for how that heat was removed, that uh, it, it to me the only solution is God's intervention that God supernaturally uh, cool these rocks down at at the end of the flood, and uh, you know there, you know, I, you know I'm at one point I find it a little surprising, and another way I don't find it that surprising, how Christians can be uh, resistant to the supernatural resistant to God acting, uh, acting in the world. Uh, but I, I, uh, I look to second Peter chapter three, uh, especially verses three through six, where P Peter is predicting that uniformitarian, uniformitarianism would, uh, arise and be prominent in the last days. And where he, he, uh, he says that, these scoffers that, that want to be uh, insist on uniformitarianism, they are willfully ignorant how God has how God intervened in the, in the affairs of nature twice in the past and will do so again a third time in the future. The two times in the past that Peter mentions are during creation and during the flood. So Peter is using uh, God's intervention supernatural intervention during the flood to make his case against uniformitarianism. So for a Christian to say that no, God could not have, did not, could not have acted uh, miraculously during the flood is contrary to that, to that passage in second Peter, contrary to what Peter is arguing. So I, I, you know, as a scientist, I'm I'm careful about just willy nilly invoking a miracle whenever I need one. But in this case, it, it, I would say one comes up against a, a, a stone wall as far as 
the laws of physics are concerned, and that the only the only plausible solution is God's intervention at this at this special point in the uh, in what happened during the flood. So I believe that the uh, runoff of the floodwaters uh, at the end of the flood was primarily a consequence of God's cooling the ocean floor, which had been formed where the rock was, at, you know, these plates began at a mid-ocean ridge with at, at very high temperature and, and, uh, and, and migrated away still at high temperature. That, that uh, hotter rock meant the bottom of the seafloor was higher that, that that rock has lower density. It raises the the bottom of the seafloor, raises the global sea level, floods the continents, and then later in the flood, then it it, it the, that rock has to be cooled down to its present temperature. And when it is, the sea levels drop. The water is able to run off the continents. The pretty you know pretty straightforward um, uh, scenario, and. Uh, so I'm, you know, Bill, so people like Bill Warker, they're trying to see if, is there some way, some way that we, we don't have to have God intervene? I say, well, you can look, good luck. But, you know, my conclusion from more than 30 years ago, 35 years ago, is the answer is no, that, that, uh, that there's nothing in the laws of physics that I know of that can, can rescue one from this conclusion. Uh, so, um, so I, I, I do, I, I do not deny the fact I had it in my very first paper. I in, in repeated it since then that that's a requirement. You know, there are people that don't like it. Okay. Well, what, what is your alternative would be my question. That is really incredible, Dr. Bumgardner. And I really appreciate it your very honest approach and very open approach to that question. And I do like how you included God in your model. It's not like God is entirely separate from your work. He's right there, part and parcel with it. Now, in these last two questions, we're going to touch on academia and academics. So concerning the opportunity to be a professor at Liberty University, you said, I jumped at the opportunity to be here to be able to mentor students, especially in issues relating to creation and the flood. Dr. Bumgardner, what advice would you give to a creationist who is looking to become a professor? Okay, well, that's uh, a, a very ambitious goal. I, w I would say that, uh, well, I, I, I often, in, in talking to students and talking to just fellow believers, quote Ephesians 2.10, where Paul writes, for we are his, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he ordained beforehand that we should walk in them, that God has good works for every, every one of his children who have trusted Jesus Christ, and that we are his workmanship. He's got, he's got good Good, uh, good works in view for us to do, and uh, so the, you know, so it's to me there's no greater blessing in the Christian life than to lay hold on what these good works are that God has uh, ordained that we should walk in. And if it happens to be uh, being a professor someplace, then by all means you need to, uh, you need to grab hold of it and and allow God to work and bring it to pass. Uh, so the I would say one one uh, important criterion is to uh, uh, find God's plan for your life is is try to hear from God do your best to hear from God. I uh, in the uh, in that, that epiphany moment in 1978, I, uh, I sensed God was saying something. I wasn't, I, I, at first I, I, I couldn't accept what I, you know, what he was telling me, 
it took a while, take, took several months for me to come around to the possible, you know, to the thought that maybe, maybe that was him speaking. But when I did say yes, some just all, all, all those incredible doors that I described began to open to me. So the, the important thing is to, um, is to seek to lay hold on God's will, God's plan for your life. The second is, um, I, I, you know, from a pretty early age, I realized I was specially gifted. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I realized, or I found myself wondering, well, what, you know, what do I do with the, these gifts, these intellectual gifts that God seems to have given me. Uh, that was a, a struggle I had because I, I, I didn't have an answer. I didn't know. I didn't know what to do with my life. And, uh, you know, I sort of was in, in confusion until I became a believer at age 26. Uh, all right. So that's one thing. Another thing is that, uh, to, to do that sort of thing requires sacrifice. So, so a lot of people today, uh, sadly, or, you know, haven't, the, the kind of life they've had hasn't demanded much discipline. They're, they're not, not able to focus, not, not prepared to make sacrifices, not prepared to work day and night. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but if I add up all the years that I, I spent in school, uh, I, I let's see, I, I spent I, I spent twelve years, you know, from first grade to out of high school, and then I spent almost an equal amount of time in college. Uh, I, I had some false starts, you know, some times I, uh, you know, I didn't know, especially before I was a Christian, I didn't know what what I was supposed to be doing. So it, it normally doesn't take that long. But, uh, you know, I, I spent close to a quarter of a century in school, if you can imagine that. And so it, it's uh, it's not a simple matter. It's not a light matter. Uh, are you willing to make the sacrifices to uh, work hard in college, uh, to uh, work hard in graduate school? Normally, uh, you know, if you if you have four years in college, it's uh, common for a person to get a Ph.D. to take another four to five years. So that's that's another that's a that's looking like eight years in college. Uh, so. Uh, so getting to the point where you would could function as a professor is going to involve a lot of work. I'll just make it that simple. And on top of that, uh, as Christians, uh, if 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 you're really serious about defending God's truth, you're you're guaranteed to to face persecution and resistance and opposition. So uh, uh, so a person needs to have the proper preparation uh, to be able to deal, to deal with opposition, to deal with criticism, you know, and, and uh, betrayal and all, all the, all those kind of negative things. Uh, and that's, that's part of Christian maturity, but uh, you, a person to, that's walking, that's doing the sort of things that God's allowed me to do, uh, you know, uh, attacks and, uh, you know, criticism, unfair criticism, just, it, it's part of the territory. I mean, it doesn't, I'm, I'm to the point where I, I can say for the most part, I, it doesn't bother me, but it, you know, it can get to you because we, you know, as Christians, we're fairly sensitive to people. And so, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, that it's uh, you, you really need to hear God's calling and you need to be prepared to work hard. Amen. 
And as anyone who's watched this interview can tell, you're an accomplished scientist and you believe the Bible. In fact, you passionately state that you believe that science confirms the Bible. I remember when I read the info about you on Liberty University, I saw this quote from you that stuck out to me. You said, I believe scientific principles and engineering expertise can be applied to the issues of origins and earth history to demonstrate in a powerful way that the Bible is trustworthy, especially in those crucial areas. My efforts have barely scratched the surface. There are spectacular research opportunities on so many fronts today. I like how you said that there's more to learn, and so with that in mind, where do you think that creationist students should start their research? What are some of those unexplored fronts? Well, I would say there's there are a few areas of science where there, there are uh, not good opportunities. We didn't talk much about my work in genetics, population genetics. I applied in the in around starting about 2005, applied the programming skill I had acquired over many years as a as a physicist to the issue of population genetics, working with Professor uh, John Stanford uh, from Cornell. We developed a a program called Mendel's Accountant, a state-of-the-art population genetics program, which shows without any question that that uh, selection, mutation and selection do do not lead to you know continuous improvement of uh, of the genetic makeup of a population, but just the opposite shows the uh, certain decline, certain degradation of the genetic makeup of a population. Uh, that's certainly true with higher animals. There's a way that microorganisms largely evade that fate, but uh, for higher, higher organisms, it's, it's certain. So there's, there's opportunities in the life sciences. Uh, there's opportunities in physics. I, I'm looking for somebody uh, who's willing to pick up this the, the C14 in diamonds project. That's that's like a that's low hanging fruit that somebody could make a big splash in. I just can't find anybody that's uh, that's interested or trained or you know willing for some reason. Uh, other aspects of the radioisotopes in the age of the Earth project. There are some of those projects uh, are just waiting to be continued and and built upon. And certainly in geology, uh, especially this work on accounting for the sediment record, uh, my model is just scratch the surface. There are, I would say, hundreds of man years of work just waiting to be done. All kinds of things just waiting to be explained uh, from a from a flood standpoint. So those are those are just a few of the areas uh, that uh, were immediate contributions could be made that would, would really make a difference in, in uh, uh, creation apologetics. Dr. Baumgartner, we've now arrived at our concluding question. In your testimony, you said that you were exposed to the evidence for a young earth and realized that the case for it was indeed solid. You also said that you went through a Bible study of the Gospel of John at College Sunday School that you became a Christian after that. For someone listening to this program, and perhaps they're starting to hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit, how does someone become a Christian? I personally believe that it, it uh, in most cases, requires a person to become familiar with who Jesus is. So that's what the study with the, in the Gospel of John did for me. It uh, it allowed me, in a firsthand way, to look at the, what Jesus said, look at how he related to other to people, and allowed me to evaluate his uh, authenticity, his claims to 
as to who he was, what, who he claimed to be, is that is there is there a, a, a sound reason for uh, concluding that he indeed is authentic? Now, in the Bible study, uh, there was a verse by verse study. Most of the people in the group were believers, were Christians. I wasn't, uh, and uh, it took me a while to realize just what the purpose of the study was, and that and it, and it actually was addressing the question, is Jesus authentic or not? And so usually uh, we, we covered about a half a chapter of, of, of the beginning in the first chapter of John a week. And uh, uh, so I, after a little while, when I realized what the issue was, I said, you know, that's a, that's, that's a very good, important question. Is Jesus authentic? And I realized that's a question that had never been on my radar screen before. And I somewhat prided myself in, you know, being somewhat of an intellectual. And I, I realized, you know, that that's a that's a very significant intellectual question, given the impact that Jesus has had on the world. And it, that that question's never occurred to me, never, never really uh been something that I thought it was important to uh, answer, but I realized as I was in this study that this issue is very important. Is Jesus authentic? And uh, so in my case, I had the opportunity in a systematic way, in a context of people who understood uh, John, they weren't uh, that to, to to engage the scripture. Uh, and 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 to evaluate that question, so I, I would say that uh, you know some people think you uh, you just need a simple formula, uh, and uh, that you you can make a, a fairly quick decision. Uh, my my assessment that is that the real issue has to do with a connection with Jesus. In or, in order for that to be real. You need to know something about Jesus. You need to have some exposure to his words, to his his miracles, his, uh, how he interacted with people, you know, how he, uh, you know, he, he, you have in the, in the New Testament, you have accounts how he dealt with a lot of people from, uh, you know, various centurions he interacted with, tax collectors. A uh, woman caught in adultery in the very act, uh, uh, you know, people that were uh, very in very desperate situation, lepers, blind people, uh, people that, uh, you know, had no hope. And yet he, uh, you see how sensitive he was, how quick he was to help people in need. And uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I think it's 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 not easy to uh, put faith in in someone that you don't know much about. So I, I would say that a good way to do this is to, to like I did, read read through uh, uh, one of the Gospels. Gospel of John is one I recommend, but others, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke also uh, give you. Uh, contact with who who Jesus is, and then once I once I, I I realized I came to the conclusion, yes, I I believe Jesus uh, is indeed who He claimed to be. There was a point in my journey where I I realized, yes, I I, I don't have I have to say I don't have any serious question that He is authentic, that He is. <clears throat> But then I realized, and I believe it was the Spirit of God showing it to me, that that awareness uh, calls out for a response on my part. Uh, and um, so I remember when I realized that, 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 uh, that my, re my realization that Jesus is authentic did call for response. Uh, and it was a little bit of an epiphany. I, I 
I, 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 I put it in that category. It was a re- fairly sudden realization that, that it, it required, it demanded a response. Then one evening in my room, I was by myself. I, I, I said, I, I said just a little prayer, something like, Jesus, I want what you're offering. Uh, I, it wasn't more, much more complicated. I don't remember the exact words, but it's something very close to that. And uh, so I didn't, it seemed like just the next step. It wasn't, I didn't consider it a big deal. I just said a little prayer like that. And uh, with, within hours, I found myself a different person. Uh, the next day, uh, you know, the day after that, I found myself with um, insights, awarenesses that I'd never had before. Uh, you know, I was in graduate school at the time, and my graduate advisor was from Scandinavia, and he every weekend would have a party for all the graduate students at his house. And, uh, you know, I was uh, in the habit of, you know, there's quite a bit of drinking. I would mix myself a drink when I went to the party so I could relax and connect, you know, relate to people a little more freely. And so a couple of, about, I don't know, three days after that, I said, Jesus, I, I want what you're offering. I, I, as usual, went to the party. Uh, as usual, mixed myself a drink. And I was, I was surprised. I, could, I, could, I, I hadn't, hadn't realized that I, I ha- had a, a, a spiritual high. I didn't realize I'd ha- I, I, I had been experiencing a, what I call a spiritual high. And within seconds, uh, starting to, to, to uh, have my drink, I, I, I could sense the effect of the alcohol interfering uh, with the high I had. And uh, that that was somewhat of a surprise. I was very conscious of that. And so those are just a few things I noticed just within, you know, days after I uh, uh, made that, took that step of, of saying yes to Jesus, come into my life. I want what you're offering. And uh, also another major thing was I found myself with an extreme desire to read the New Testament. So I started reading through the New Testament about once a week, even though I was in a very demanding graduate program. And, uh, and it was just the most exciting thing I had ever experienced, the, the, the understanding uh, and the insight, spiritual insight, the discovery of, of why things are the way they are. And uh, so with that kind of input, I, I found myself growing spiritually very rapidly. So in short, I, I, I would describe I had a, 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 a dramatic conversion experience. And just, just within days or weeks, I was a radically different person. And uh, so I, 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 I credit it to having uh, had a good exposure to who Jesus is by reading uh, the gospel account, gospel account of record of his life, and then the Holy Spirit working in me, taking that word and and bringing me to the point of realizing that I desperately needed what Jesus was was offering, forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And uh, so I just I just share that with somebody who perhaps uh, they've gone to church, they consider the, themselves a Christian, but that that what I'm describing really has never taken place in their life. And it could well be that they have never really come to grips with who Jesus is and never really come to grips with uh, a having a transaction with Jesus and having him uh, become uh, Lord, Savior, uh, friend in their life. So uh, I think I'll just leave it at that as far as how a person becomes a Christian. I believe that's, uh, that's, those, are, those are some of the important elements. Amen, Dr. Baumgartner. And thank you so much for your time. 
It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Dr. John Bumgardner's website, globalflood.org, his autobiographical information, and other creation links in the description below. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.